Great. Okay. Uh, I guess we can we can get started. Uh, so let me share my screen and hand it over to you. Okay, Kali, I, I think you can get started. All right. Thanks, everyone. So uh, thank you for coming. And today's topic, we are talking about uh, having an efficient Spark scheduling with Apache Unicorn. Uh, next slide. So have a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Li Gao. I'm currently I'm the tech lead on uh, Databricks uh, Compute Fabric team. Previously, I was leading the data infrastructure, uh, especially the compute infrastructure at Lyft. And uh, Wei Wei uh, Yang, he, right now he is a tech lead at Cloudera Compute Platform, and he is a Apache Hadoop committer and a PMC member, previously tech lead at Real-Time Compute Infra at Alibaba. Next. All right. So before we introduce the, the Apache Unicorn, I want to set a stage uh, uh, right now for Apache Spark. There are different ways to run Spark at a uh, scale uh, in production. So this one gives a highlight of uh, what are potential ways to run Spark uh, currently. Uh, uh, there are different uh, from uh, flow of uh, follow this diagram. You can see there's uh, typically there are two different types of uh, uh, persona that can invoke Spark. There are users, interactive users, uh, data engineers, scientists, and machine uh, and the deep learning scientists, and so on. And there's also different kinds of jobs, bots, and uh, scripts that can talk to you through uh, different sets of API for Spark, uh, program API, uh, there's also job service uh, API that uh, eventually come down to a uh, uh, core component in Spark, which is Spark Core and Scheduler that can launch in different compute resources. Uh, in the beginning, Spark has a, 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 the majority of the uh, production worker running on Apache, uh, uh, Hadoop and Apache Young specifically in Hadoop 2.0, and later there is also Mesa OS. And, uh, Recent trend is on Kubernetes, and obviously there is also a long cluster mode, which is standalone mode. Uh, those one can run on either a public cloud or on um, premise, premise and or hybrid of both. And the storage typically talks to different block storage and uh, uh, or uh, uh, block storage. Uh, next slide. So. The, one of the reasons we want to use uh, Kubernetes to run Spark uh, uh, in the recent trend is uh, uh, Kubernetes is one of the, uh, uh, right now is the most popular container orchestration engine, uh, not just for Spark, but for many other microservices and so on. So the advantage of uh, choosing uh, Kubernetes to run in Spark these days is first it, pro it provides a shared resource capability that can uh, that can share the compute resource uh, between different types of jobs, and also because of the nature of containerization, it can support multiple Spark versions, Python versions, and even you can version control those different containers in a shared cluster. So it does much more efficient and fine-grained control of those resource usage on the cluster for both a uh, faster iteration on the development side and a stable uh, production rollout uh, in the production side. Uh, the third one uh, that's important to choose Kubernetes these days to run Spark is uh, uh, with the, uh, this one, uh, Kubernetes provides a, a forward-compatible unified infrastructure, not just for data compute, but for many of uh, microservice ecosystems that uh, can have a single pane of observability and the resource isolation support or in a single uh, pane of glass. The, uh, the last one is, this one is critical for uh, enterprise support is uh, in the container world, in the containerized uh, Kubernetes, the, Access control can be very fine-grained at a different part level and a different uh, and uh, at a different uh, uh, 
uh, uh, at a different job level, uh, which is uh, much harder to do in the past uh, in a non-containerized uh, resource compute. Next slide, please. So beyond uh, this Kubernetes, there's also a pattern emerging in the last uh, couple of years, which is called multi-cluster compute uh, using Kubernetes. Uh, because the capability of Kubernetes can be uh, federated in, across many different clusters. So imagine uh, uh, at an even larger compute world, you can have this uh, pool clusters using different, uh, I call here the data uh, gateway API. And that can share persistence or or have uh, isolated uh, resources and with shared metadata. That multi-cluster compute can even scale cluster compute uh, on Kubernetes even more beyond a single cluster, which is a pattern emerging that the Unicorn, uh, Apache Unicorn later will introduce uh, uh, the future roadmap that can start supporting multi-cluster compute for Spark on Kubernetes. Next slide, please. Um, before I dive into the, uh, 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 the deeper on that one, uh, let's go back to a single in a single Spark job in a single uh, Spark uh, 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 Kubernetes cluster. This is uh, anatomy of the running a Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, the reason I introduced this one is this one is key to for us to understand how the existing uh, Spark on Kubernetes works through the cluster manager that is part of the Apache Spark. Uh, uh, and uh, in the Kubernetes world, uh, this cluster manager is talking to the Kube API to allocate individual uh, parts uh, in the driver part, executor part, the driver uh, also sending to the Kube API to allocate these different parts. Uh, but uh, from the scheduler perspective, uh, uh, the Kube scheduler by default, uh, in, the default uh, in the default scheduler, it can only allocate uh, at the level of the nodes and parts uh, to do the binding. Uh, right now, the missing piece is uh, uh, allocation on the Spark app level. So that creates a few issues as we scale the Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one of the issues, uh, uh, as I uh, illustrated in the previous slide, is uh, default scheduler is a part level scheduling. And uh, in the... Uh, uh, in a, 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 a scheduling uh, scenario, you can imagine on Kubernetes, uh, when there's many different uh, Spark clusters uh, requests come in to allocate these different parts because the Kube scheduler is focusing on the part level, there, uh, there are uh, situations there can be resource racing between different parts from different uh, Spark clusters, which can uh, uh, make uh, uh, the jobs become less efficient for, uh, for both uh, resource uh, utilization and, uh, uh, and the latency perspective for those different jobs. That's one uh, uh, issues we've seen in the past for default scheduler of Kubernetes to, for Spark. Another one is uh, 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 we've tried uh, using the Kubernetes pod priority, which is uh, one of the features built in with Kubernetes. The, the prior of priority can set the scheduling preference or the priority between different pods. We can potentially tag with different uh, Spark pods to say uh, there's a priority schedule between those one. But the problem with that uh, pod uh, priority is a static. So it becomes harder as you have many different types of Spark jobs or Spark clusters coming on, on this uh, given Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's become even harder to dynamically adjust the, uh, the priority parameter or relative priorities between different uh, Spark jobs. Uh, and also there's no guarantee the higher priorities will actually get scheduled across this different pod, uh, different nodes. Uh, and the uh, last one is uh, uh, the common issue we're seeing is there's uh, for certain jobs, especially like uh, uh, high priority streaming jobs, there are uh, need for uh, uh, first in first out of the scheduling uh, capability for the uh, for the job as a whole instead of individual parts of the job. For those cases, the the coop scheduler is lacking uh, a guarantee of the uh, FIPO scheduling for us, uh, during the resource uh, racing scenario. Next slide, please. So let's continue. There are a few other issues uh, uh, at even uh, uh, 
larger Kubernetes we, uh, we've seen in the past. Uh, one of the is a higher latency for a scheduler when you have a lot of different uh, uh, part uh, allocations on a uh, uh, given large Kubernetes cluster, for example, you have a, a, a large number of hundreds of nodes uh, uh, approaching a thousand nodes. If there are scheduling latency, if you have a lot of parts coming in, latency can be as high as about 100 seconds, which can introduce uh, unacceptable latency to your jobs. Uh, and the, uh, the one is uh, the fair uh, sharing of the resources become very unpredictable in those clusters, large clusters uh, for the default scheduler. Even without uh, FIFO, the, the fair sharing is not there or not reliably working. Uh, and uh, uh, in certain workload, large clusters, especially for those job-oriented uh, clusters, there is always a need to balance between the different FIFO and fair requirements to share those with the compute resources, but it's uh, not there uh, uh, to achieve with, using the default scheduler. Uh, there are also a few things that is uh, uh, from usability side to have a visibility from operational and the production uh, uh, production usage of those uh, large clusters is uh, we need a way to manage dynamic manage uh, those uh, hierarchy of those priorities or hierarchy of the different uh, uh, FIFO parameters uh, and also the uh, we uh, from the operation side there's a need for a richer and uh, uh, and uh, uh, online uh, user visibility into what's going on with the scheduling and see uh, uh, how the scheduling latency is. So all of uh, is not available at the current uh, stage with the default scheduler. So next slide. So uh, where you want to continue? So we are now we are moving on to introduce how Uticon, the new scheduler, can help to scaling Spark on Kubernetes. Thank you, Lee. Um, so uh, Lee just introduced the the, prob the the motivation why we move Spark on Kubernetes and um, the problems we saw uh, where we run large scale Spark on Kubernetes. So. Uh, eventually, so Spark is a unified data process engine and it's really powerful, but it's also very complex, right? So um, right now we have Kubernetes, so we can build a common infra infrastructure to, to run our Spark workloads, workloads on, on, on prime, on cloud, public cloud, private cloud, any cloud, right? This is very flexible. Uh, but when user starts lands on Kubernetes, um, the, their business logic is complex. So they have um, a lot of uh, lot of types of jobs. They have ad hoc queries, they have batch jobs, they have workflows, and they have stream jobs. What does this mean? So potentially this could be very large scale. And also it can have both batch and long running jobs. Uh, when you run long running jobs on Kubernetes, that's easy. But you, when you run large scale batch jobs on Kubernetes, uh, it's become problematic. And also uh, in Spark, some of the deep learning pipelines will have very strict constraints. In this case, you usually you need the scheduling help to help you to guarantee, for example, the gun scheduling. And also um, we are facing the issues that we have multiple users or teams to share the environment, how we can plan the capacity in the cluster, how we can make sure these teams or users can, can work with each other peacefully. So that's a, that's also a very big challenge. Um, and also when user starts to consume the pro platform, you, they, we will need to make sure their job priorities and SRAs can be satisfied. So all these are very um, complex problems. We do not have a solution today. So um, the challenges can fall into three categories. Um, the first one is resource management. Uh, we need the fine green resource management comparing today on Kubernetes. Uh, we need to pursue the balance between the resource sharing and the efficiency uh, for multi-tenancy environment. This is uh, something missing today in Kubernetes. The second challenge is the job scheduling. Uh, like Lee just mentioned, so uh, on the default Kubernetes scheduler doesn't do any of the job scheduling. So it only schedules the pods. Um, it doesn't have any job level scheduling capability, which is not very good for 
for, for our complex scenarios. Uh, uh, essentially, Kubernetes service-oriented resource scheduler that doesn't, that cannot satisfy the needs to run complex big data scenarios. And also the performance. Uh, this is also very important. Um, when you run a lot of jobs on your cluster, the performance means, uh, the higher performance means you can save more cost. Uh, this is a critical factor to reduce the, to control the cost and also can improve uh, the SLAs of the jobs. Then um, that's why we, we start a project. Um, Apache Unicorn is an incubating project right now. And um, we've been starting, we, we've been working on this project since early 2019. Uh, it is a standalone resource manager for, for Kubernetes. Um, we, built it, we have uh, built um, all the essential scheduling capabilities into this scheduler to make sure uh, we can address the, the needs to run big data on Kubernetes. And uh, we have used the decoupled design. So we have a abstraction of the scheduler interface. So Unicorn is not just can run on Kubernetes, it can run for, it can um, port it to other system as well, very easily. The major features we, we have included in Unicorn includes um, the first one is the hierarchy of queues. Um, so it provides the fine grain control over the resources for different tenants, right? That means can can set up the hierarchical queues, possibly that can can map to the, the organizing, uh, organization architecture, the structure of the organization and uh, set up some min and max queue capacity to make sure uh, each of the queue can get its own fair sharing, the minimal resource, and also have a control on the max quota. Um, so this kind of a module, um, this is kind of mode can define how elastic can it can be for each of the resource queues. And the uh, second feature is the job scheduling, which is uh, very, very important for, for, for big data workloads. So Unicorn will queue the jobs in resource queues and uh, schedule them with respect to the certain ordering and policy. The ordering policy is, is the key to ensure that the jobs can be scheduled um, as expected. And um, also the policy can be customized. Uh, right now we have FIFO, we have uh, FAIR, uh, depends on the different needs. And uh, also we are working on the priority support. So um, from the job level, we can do a lot of things. And uh, the third, is the essential capabilities. So this means we will need this essential scheduling capabilities to ensure the high performance um, of the scheduling. And, uh, and um, also we have the needs to support, support some of the scheduling features like gun scheduling, resource reservation, preemption. All these features are essential for running big data or the AI workloads on Kubernetes. Uh, the last one is cloud native. So Unicorn, uh, from the first day, we are design, designing it to be a lightweight and uh, uh, very, very easy to e extend. Uh, this is a scheduler that can be easily installed on Kubernetes and uh, it can work with the cluster auto scheduler very easily to, to be running on, on cloud. And um, also it can work with the auto scheduler to scale up and down the compute push. Uh, it is a stately service and uh, can be very, very easily deployed. Um, let's go over, look into a little more detail about how Spark is running with Unicorn. Um, this is a complete example. Um, this is the user's view and this is the, what happens in Kubernetes and uh, this is um, what happens in Unicorn. So at the beginning, user submits a Spark job uh, it can be done by Spark Summit, where it can be done by by creating a Spark application CRD, which is uh, which leverage the Spark operator. So um, from Kubernetes, we can see the Spark driver will be will be pending. So this is how Spark works, right? The the, the first uh, uh, pod will be the driver, and the driver will apply for the executor pods. Then in Unicorn, um, we are putting the driver pod to, we know that this is from one of the, one of the application and I'll put the application into one of the leaf queue in the hierarchy. And then inside of the Unicorn, we start to 
allocate the resource for this for this part. What we do um, a big difference comparing to the default scheduler. We we will do the all the sort of the queues. We'll find it, uh, which queue needs the resource most. Then we go to that queue and then do our sorting on the applications within that queue. And then we pick up application, then do another sorting on the request to find the right part to allocate the resource. So this um, gives us some of the, we can have some policies on the queue level and the, on the app level and the request level uh, to determine how to sort them. And once we make a location, um, so uh, until now the driver pods will be pending on the system. The job is still in the starting phase. Once we have made the application, the uh, unicorn will ask the APS, APS server to bind the pod to a node. And uh, so we will see from Kubernetes, we'll see the job, driver pod is bound to a specific node and the driver user will see the driver is running. The driver pod is running. Once the driver started, it will initialize. Um, once it is initialization is finished, it will start to apply for, for the executors for its actually task, right? So we'll see a bunch of uh, executors get created in the on Kubernetes. And again, in this uh, hierarchy, we are putting all these executors into a certain lift queue and into a certain application. So we'll see those uh, pending pods for this application. Um, again, we will do those sorting and uh, look at from the queues to the app to the pod and, the note, and uh, find the best node for this pod. Um, do this again. This is a scheduling cycle. Then we can find uh, one allocation at a time for, for the executors. Then we'll see all the executors have been bound to the, to, on the system and the Spark job is running. Then I will go over, uh, go through some of the examples to show uh, why this can make it is different um, comparing to the to the default scheduler. Um, in each of the charts, I have uh, left hand set. We have um, uh, this is the case where we don't do not have the unicorn, and the right hand set uh, is the case where we have the unicorn installed on the cluster. So uh, very simple. The first first example is we run a large number of uh, of concurrent jobs in the same namespace. This is common. So if you want to run something on Kubernetes, you always run them in the namespace, right? So uh, it is very common that a lot of people uh, run their concurrent jobs in the Spark jobs in the same names namespace. So we're on the on this side, we can see there's um, job one to job n. And each job will have one driver and uh, multiple executors. We do not know, we do not know how many jobs are there, uh, but we just go ahead to submit them to the namespace. So what happens next? We'll see in the namespace. Uh, of course, there will be a resource quota uh, defined if without unicorn. There will be a resource quota defined for each of the namespace to make sure um, we have the quota management. And uh, what we'll see is um, only the driver pods. So the, this uh, pod highlighted with the, this color is the driver pod. Only the driver pod gets allocated. And uh, all these pods will use all the resources in the queue, uh, in, the, in the resource quota, which means uh, we what we will see is the job one and job eight are started, but only the driver pods are running. And the job line to the rest of the jobs are, are all filled because um, they are rejected by the, by the animation controller. Uh, because they are exceeding the resource quota. So this is bad, right? So user will have to resubmit their jobs from job line to job n, and uh, they, they might need to do that multiple times until all the jobs can run. However, with Unicorn, it will be different. So Unicorn, we, have, um, we still run the jobs in the namespace, but we'll have a queue mapped to that namespace automatically. And we can enforce the faithful ordering and also, if, if we need, we can select another policy, but we will use a FIFO ordering as the, as the example. Um, what Unicorn did do differently is uh, it will allocate the resource for the first job and wait it until um, the driver pods apply for its executors. So we will see on this cluster, in this namespace, we will see the job one and job two uh, get started and the rest of the driver pods will be pending. So job job three to job n are pending 
And after some time, because this is a batch, you know, we're running some of the batch jobs, some of the parts will, will finish and release the resource. Then we all see the job three, um, the driver pod gets allocated for job three. And uh, uh, along with some other pods get free resource, we can see the job and start it. So eventually all the, all the jobs will be finished without further user interaction. Uh, it will simplify the, the client side operations. Um, another thing is the job queue. Um, when you submit a, the, the cases, when you submit a Spark job to a namespace where the, all the resource has been used, uh, has already been used by other parts, this is also very common um, because um, our clusters are busy. So you don't know, um, the, there might be possible that the namespace have, do not have enough resource for your job. So let's say someone uh, starts the job and submit to this namespace. Again, we have the resource quota to control the quota. You will see the pod will be directly rejected, right? And the job will fail. This is again, uh, this is not something user really want. Uh, like I mentioned here, this is some lazy user. I, I would like you, the system, to handle the finger for me. So with Unicorn, is different. So the pod will be pending here, waiting for resources. Uh, once some of the resources being released in the in the namespace. Uh, it will be allocated to the namespace. So there's nothing else the user needs to do. Eventually the job will be finished. And also another example is the job priority. So right now, let's say um, the example is we submit a high priority job when the class is fully utilized. This is something very urgent. I want to get results uh, really soon. And uh, without Unicorn, when we submitted the job to the system, as you can see, the both the namespaces are being uh, fully utilized. What will happen? It will trigger the preemption. Let's, let's, let's um, assume that we have enabled the preemption. So you will try to start to print other parts uh, based on the priority class. So this will happen very randomly, right? You don't know, you don't have control which part it will go, it will go and the print. Uh, it could be, so it could be print multiple jobs, like the example here. It print uh, two, it print uh, parts from two jobs, two different jobs. It could be print uh, printing other parts belonging to other namespaces, uh, or print a part from higher priority jobs, which is also bad. But uh, default scheduler doesn't have a job priority, so. Uh, but either way, it is bad. And with Unicorn, what we can do is we can enforce the job preemption only happen, happens in the job level. And if you have a higher level priority job, um, we can make sure the job only print the, the lower priority job part within the same namespace. So in this case, we can ensure only minimal side of the job gets affected by the preemption and the rest of job should be still running as, uh, as they need to be. Um, another important thing is about the resource fairness because we are, we are we, we kept talking about um, how to share the resource between tenants. So resource fairness is a key. Um, in this example, um, we have two users here, uh, Kevin and Jessica. So um, they submit a lot of jobs in their own namespaces. As you can see, we have two different namespaces for the users. This is also very common because we want to each of tenant to have their own namespace. And we have a dedicated quota for each of the namespace. So what, what we'll say, if they submit a lot of jobs and uh, what we'll say, it's a possibility that we'll, uh, so the Kevin's namespace get fully allocated, all the resource, all the jobs get their resources to run, but um, left the cluster doesn't have enough resource for to run the Jessica's um, um, job, which what turns out to be like this. Um, uh, Kevin gets more resource, but uh, Jessica were not happy. This is very common in the in the on Kubernetes without a fairness um, guarantee, right? Um, here, Jessica won't be happy because um, her job will get affected by some other one's job, and uh, the assets cannot be satisfied, and uh, also the job execution time will become very unpredictable. So what happens with Unicorn? With Unicorn, we are enforcing the resource fairness allocation between 
uh, between these namespaces. So we will be able to uh, ensure that the users get similar amount of resources and we're not going to starve any of the user because of this. And um, if the cluster has some free resource freed up, then user uh, runs below his fair share, we'll get a resource first. So they have the fairness. Um, we guarantee the fairness for each of the tenant, uh, which will be good for, for the multi-tenancy environment. Um, another thing very important, the fine green resource called management. Uh, without Unicorn, what you can do is to set up uh, a bunch of uh, Kubernetes namespaces. Each of the namespaces can set up, set up with a certain quota, uh, but namespaces are flat. So you can only set up something like this. And uh, also when you, when you use the quota to manage this cluster resource, the quota is always overbooked. So um, sometimes you are, even you get your quota but you are not able to use the resource because some other ones will be using the resources, taking the resources from you. And with Unicorn, the things were a bit different. So we can set up a hierarchy of queues like this. So this is something we can set in the configuration. Uh, these are called the pretty um, static queues. Um, they are the parents. And uh, these are the, still the namespaces and we can easily attach namespace to a certain parent. So in this way, we can we can control the the overall capacity plan. Um, this can map to the organization structure uh, based on the multi tenancy needs. So this is pretty dynamic, and we're we are leveraging the placement rules to do this. So all the things are happen automatically. You do do not do, you do not need to do a lot of changes or configurations. Um, and the, the last, we have a very a good central management UI where you can keep track of um, keep tracking of what happens on your cluster. You can see the applications. You can see about the pods, and um, we have a list of applications. You can you can you can track the information of the application and also the the queues. So the major difference um, we have uh, we have a lot of features compared to the default scheduler, such as scheduling the app job ordering, fine green resource management, resource fairness. Those are the things I just covered from those examples. Very simple, but they're very important. And also native supports the big data workloads. Currently we are running Unicorn with, uh, with, with Spark, Flink, TensorFlow, uh, very heavily on some of the environment. And uh, we have a better, we have a pretty good skill and the performance. We have some perform, perform, performance evaluation on thousands of nodes. And uh, we can roughly achieve um, um, two times better um, than the default scheduler. And I uh, will go just uh, very quickly talk about the recent work. Um, the very re recent one is the GAN scheduling. So we are introducing GAN scheduling in the next release. Uh, this is the all and last thing, um, semantics. So user can, can specify the task group, like uh, what do we have defined here as an example and uh, which uh, specify the, the GAN members. And also um, we, we have introduced that in general application CRD. So user can very easily to integrate with, with the app CRD and the, to, to, to leverage this scheduling capabilities more easily. And also um, there's a configurable scheduling policy which determine the behavior, what you want to, what user wants to, um, to wants the scheduler to, to schedule the application uh, when, when in different associations. And also um, another recent work is the federation. And uh, um, Gali just mentioned uh, when we moved to, when we moved to Kubernetes and one of the major issues is about the scalability. Um, in, I just uh, joined the Hadoop meetup uh, last week and uh, some of the Hadoop users actually are running very large scale um, Hadoop clusters thousands of nodes or even tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, when we move those large scale workloads to Kubernetes, uh, we cannot do that in a single cluster and we will need to expand our clusters uh, to get them as a compute pools. And in this architecture, we can deploy uh, multiple compute pools and each of them will be managed by, um, manage and the schedule and the scheduling will be done by Unicorn as a member. And uh, we can scale out, we can scale out as many as, um, classes we want, 
and all those those cluster compute pools will report their resource usage, uh, all those status to the uh, Unicorn Group Manager, where is the federation-like architecture so admin can manage the resource from the central place on the control plane. And the users only needs to work with the gateway and the gateway will dispatch their job to a certain uh, certain compute pool to, 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 to run the jobs. So this is very flexible to scale the, the entire platform. Currently, uh, we have open sourced uh, since July 17. And um, it, uh, the Unicorn project is now a Apache incubator since January uh, 2020. Uh, latest datable version is 0 0.9. Uh, we just released a month ago. And um, we have a very good community members from Alibaba, Cloudera, Microsoft. A, a, a lot of um, uh, companies are joining this com community to help us to build this project. I'm, I'm quite thankful for, for that. And uh, last, um, I want to call out to, to join us in the community. If you like, if you're interested, to, interested about how to run how to run big data on, on Kubernetes. Uh, this is definitely a project you want to look at. So we have the our, all the, our information public on the website. We have the GitHub repo if you would like to to read some code, and also we have a, a mailing list, the Slack channel used for for communication, um, and also we have the biweekly and the monthly sync up meetings for different time zones. So you will find a spot if you like to join us. Thank you. That's all for today. Um, so um, not sure. Do we have any questions? Okay, I got a question. There's a similar project, Palantir, Palantir Forks, called uh, Rubix and Collection. We do not have any collection with Palantir. So I what I know is Palantir has a Kubernetes um, extender, scheduler extender. It's not a a scheduler from built from scratch, so it uh, adds some some plugin uh, to do to um, specific for some improvements for Spark. Uh, that's something I am aware of. I'm not sure if that is the Rubix, um, but that is still uh, follow the same same workflow as the default scheduler. Um, I don't think uh, they can easily support the uh, applications queues like we were just talking about. Um, it's uh, kind of a different. So we don't we do not have any connection with them, and we were so Unicorn is a standalone scheduler. We worked that from the scratch, so it's uh, it can be replaced the uh, default scheduler instead of a plugin. I think that's the major difference. Oh, got a second question. Would it be able to expand one of the points where you mentioned Unicorn is optimized for performance? Uh, very interesting. So for performance, um, we actually, so one of the major improvement we have done is um, Unicorn itself is a stateless service. So we run every compute in memory. Uh, we, are, we are reducing the most of the interactions with IP, API server and we do the uh, scheduling cycle um, in the in the memory, and we do the notes, and we do the optimizations for the uh, job and the queue sorting policies, um, and uh, more importantly for the node sorting, we do some of the um, we have some cache mechanism in the in 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 the code to make sure that we when we do the node sorting, we do it with high performance. So those are the things we have done for to improve the performance, and uh, roughly can get it about. Um, Twice better than the than the default scheduler. We have a report um, in the in our website. So if you like, you can take a look uh, how we evaluate the performance with with Kubemark with the simulations. Yeah, performance actually have multiple uh, angles to this. One is this uh, uh, scheduling uh, latency and uh, and throughput. Another one is the actual efficiency. Uh, the the resource utilization efficiency of the compute resource from the application perspective. So in the in the case of the Spark jobs, batch jobs, the efficiency of the Spark job uh, uh, resource utilization has improved a lot with the Unicorn scheduler compared to the default scheduler in a busy Kubernetes cluster. 
any concern to have related to Kubernetes upgrade? Is there any risk of version conflict between the main branch? Okay, so uh, this is a good question. So right now we are uh, we are supporting uh, Kubernetes version from 114 to 116. 117 is something we haven't done a uh, lot of testing, but I personally, I don't think we are, we have a big issue to support that version because basically this is, um, we implement the schedule from scratch. We have some dependency uh, from the Kubernetes, but we are using the majorly the, the, the public APIs and those APIs won't, won't be changing a lot of course releases. Um, and also um, the major dependency for the Kubernetes version might be might be the predicts. So we leverage some of the Kubernetes APIs to run the predicts for us. For that part, if we have some issue with 117, that might be it, but uh, most likely I, I do not expect there being a lot of issues because the things we're using are pretty stable. Thanks for the questions, so great questions. Maybe we can stay for another few minutes so we can get more questions. Will slides be available somewhere? I think so. So I think at least uh, we were submitting our slides to, to our perch um, comfort glazer. Um, they, they should be putting this somewhere. I, I believe so. And the video will be available on the YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. Questions, more questions? <laughs> Maybe we can stay for another one or two minutes in case we have some more questions. Well, uh, we always welcome to, uh, you know, we have the website. Maybe you can just Google, you can see our website. And uh, there has some, we, we publish some of the um, contact information, Slack channel, uh, where the community meetings there, so you can you can join us. If you have any more questions or you want to know more about Unicorn, feel free to reach out to us. We're very happy to get more people involved in the in the community, so we can possibly to build this project better. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's it for today. Thank you guys. Thank you for joining us with the meeting. Thank you, Gali. Thank you today. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Mm. Bye. Bye-bye.